Hi folks, uh, David Hamilton here. I'm the Psychologies Magazine Kindness Czar. Now, if you're just joining me for the first time, uh, that basically means that once a month I come on here, Facebook Live, well, I do, I write a little piece in the fix section of the magazine, but every month I come on here, do a little Facebook Live, and I usually talk about kindness and lots of the different aspects of kindness and the science of what kindness does for your health. But this is a, a kind of special uh, Facebook Live. And I say special because uh, the editor-in-chief of the magazine, uh, Susie, asked if I could, uh, could talk a bit about, you know, men's stuff, you know, ex you know expressing feelings and vulnerability. Right, because you may or may not have seen it already, but this is this this month's awesome edition, a kind of man's edition of the magazine. You know, I just realised the other day that uh, that when you do a Facebook live, somehow it inverts the live stream. So this is my right hand, but it's coming up on the screen as my left hand, which means this is probably written as if it should be read in a mirror. So if you want to get really technical, you can hold a mirror up. And then you'll be able to read psychologies uh, just above Chris Hemsworth's head there. You'd actually see the word psychologies not written backwards. So anyway, a bit, a bit of fun there. But anyway, I, so, so Susie asked if I could, you know, just talk a wee bit. Because she said this is a very special issue because it, it's a lot of it talks, a lot of it centres on the, I guess, the, the need for, in terms of mental health, the need for uh, men to learn to, to express emotion. You know, that certainly isn't something that, that came natural to me. I, I always learned, and I say I learned, my mum and dad did teach me this, and, and I don't really know where it came from. Maybe school, call it society, I don't really know. But I learned that, that when I was feeling hurt or sad, then I wasn't to cry, I was to man up. You know, so so that meant. Look, I remember hearing big girls, big boys don't cry or something. I, I don't really know. I think we just pick these kind of things up, uh, and so for years I would never express, you know, feelings. I remember you talk to your pals and you, you talk about you know sports and business and stuff, but we don't talk about how we feel. Uh, and so Susie asked me if I could could talk a wee bit about this uh, in this Facebook live. Really, maybe, and in fact, to be honest, I didn't really know what I would talk about. And I thought, well, maybe the best thing I can do is just share some of my personal experiences. And maybe that itself, some, some men and, and women it might be able it, to relate to. But I, I, I want to share one, I, I think, really important experience in my life. About 20 odd years ago, 1994, I, I, I struggled with depression for the first time. And I didn't tell anyone. I was right in the middle of my PhD. And, and I was really struggling. I, I was finding it increasingly more difficult to even get out of bed in the morning. And I was starting to come into the lab late in the morning. And that didn't really go, sit well with my professor, who was expecting us all to be there bright and early and get on with our, our research. And I was just really struggling. And, and I didn't tell anyone, not my professor, not my best friends, and I eventually, I went to the doctor because I didn't know what else to do. I just couldn't shake this heavy feeling and a feeling of, of sadness and tightness and, and, and really struggling to, to even participate in conversations. I always felt like I needed to get away. My friends were talking. I felt I just needed to get out of the room kind of thing. And I went to the doctor and the doctor said I could prescribe you antidepressants and he said you're suffering from depression and I was like horrified because my mum had suffered with depression she had postnatal or postpartum as they say in the US a postnatal depression when I was a child after my youngest sister was born and I knew I'd saw what depression could do and I never for a moment imagined that that's what I had and I thought oh my god and and I felt ashamed literally ashamed and the doctor said so I could prescribe you antidepressants and I mentioned to him that I was, the reason why I came is because I was just about to, to do a three month placement in, with the company who sponsored my PhD. Uh, and I wanted, I didn't want to carry this feeling and this unsociableness 
a part of me down into that job. So I wanted some, some, you know, answer. I don't know what I needed, what I wanted from the doctor. I just needed. I think I needed to talk to someone. And the doctor said I could prescribe you antidepressants, but what I think you need is a change of scenery. And you've told me that you're going away for three months, so maybe I think that will be better for you than an antidepressant. Uh, and, and, it, and it did turn out to be the best thing. I had to move from uh, Glasgow, where I was doing my PhD, down to Dartford in Kent. And I worked for a company, a pharmaceutical company there for three months while I was doing my PhD. And I, and I needed the break, the, the rest. And when I came back, it was new scenery, new challenges. And, and I think that just new experience was enough to help me. And then I came back with a different feeling and attitude. But about four years later, I was working in the pharmaceutical industry myself, so now I was a scientist. Uh, and I went through this period of about probably four or five months when it got so bad that I remember I used to leave the office or leave the lab uh, as early as I could, as early as we were allowed, uh, leave the lab, get out into the car, drive home, park outside my house, uh, open the door, lock the door, close the curtains, lie on the floor and cry. And I did that a heck of a lot of the time. And again, I knew this time it was depression and I just couldn't shake it. And again, it, I was withdrawing from people. I could barely sit in conversation, even with my friends, we go to the pub and, and I was struggling with things to say. And I just wanted to get away. And it wasn't the kind of thing you can, uh, you know, uh, to be really honest, I felt I had no one to talk to, despite the fact I had friends. And even back when I did my PhD, again, even though I had great friends and a good relationship with my professor, I, I didn't, I felt I had no one to talk to. And I, I wasn't getting on with my professor at that time, actually, because he was perceiving my attitude and my work time schedule as being lazy and lacking interest. And I think, and so that didn't go sit very well with him. But in his defence, I think, I didn't tell him that I was struggling with depression. And wind the clock forward, and here I was in the same situation. Despite having great friends, I felt I had no one to talk to. Because as a man, and again, this is something that I, I guess I don't know where I learned it from, we just don't talk about how we feel. And we were supposed to man up. And I felt ashamed, with, ashamed of myself because I wasn't manning up. You know, I thought surely other guys feel like this, but they're all out and enjoying themselves and they're playing football and they're drinking beers at the pub and, and I feel, you know, weak. Uh, and, 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 I, and I felt ashamed of myself because I was feeling that way and I didn't have anyone to talk to. And that sounds mad given the fact that I had these you know, great friends and a great relationship with my mum and my dad and my three sisters. But I literally felt I had no one to talk to again because when I go out with my pals, you, we talk about sports or, or business or, you know, guy stuff, but we, we don't talk about how we feel. And it was getting worse and worse and worse and I really didn't know what to do. And my mum must have sensed something because she used to phone me up every other day uh, when I was working in the pharmaceutical industry and say, I feel like there's something you're not telling me. And I'm going, oh, mum, I feel great. I'm, you know, everything's going great. Life and soul apart, you know me, kind of thing. And she said, no, I just feel like the, there's something, that you, you, there's something wrong and you're not telling me. And, and, and part of me was desperate to tell my mum, but I just I was scared to, kind of thing. And then one day, just when it was getting really bad and I'd had a wee cry on the floor earlier in the night and, and literally fell asleep on the floor after a cry, and I woke up and the phone was ringing, it was my mum. And she said, you're, something you're not telling me. And I kind of paused in my voice as I didn't give her the usual. You know, I'm great mum, everything's going great in my life. And then she knew, what is it son? And I started crying and I told her I was feeling, I was depressed and, and I didn't know what to do. And she said, right, get in the car, you're coming home now. <laughs> and here I was 250 miles away and uh, and I said, right, I'll come home in the morning. And so I waited until the office opened in the morning. I phoned the office and I told them I wasn't coming in. And I got in the car and as my mum ordered me to do, I drove 250 miles home. And 
Uh, and that was the beginning of my journey to wellness, was telling my mum. And all of a sudden, over the next three or four days, I just talked to my mum and poured my heart out for the first time in my life. Don't think I'd ever really poured my heart out and cried and shared all these things. And, uh, and here I was, you know, opening up to my mum. The first time I'd ever opened up to a person really in my whole life. And I'm in my late 20s. But my God, did that work. My God, did that help. You know, I didn't cure depression, but my God, it was like a weight off my shoulders talking about how I feel and, and what was going, what was happening in my life, where I needed to go. And, and I began a very gentle, slow, but gentle recovery from depression, which started with expressing how I felt to my mum. And, and one of the things I learned, in, in hindsight, one of the things I learned there is not only is it okay, okay and I'm saying this as a... As a it doesn't mean that, that this isn't the same for girls. I can only talk from the perspective of, of a guy, uh, I guess. But not only is it just okay to talk about your feelings, it's vital to talk about your feelings. Uh, and, and not only is it okay to have a cry from time to time, it is vital uh, to have a cry if that's how your emotional state is at that time. And it's about not bottling things up. And, and we tend to bottle things up uh, it, you know, and this isn't just a guy thing. I know uh, many women do this as well, but again, I can only talk from a perspective of what it's been like for, for me and for a number of guys that, that I know. And I learned that it's not just okay to have a cry. It's not just okay to express emotion. It is vital that we do these things and get them off our chest. Uh, and that began my gentle recovery uh, from depression. And uh, to cut a really long story short, ta-da! <laughs> uh, but, but, you know... A few years later, here I, here I am. Uh, I, I, what led me to doing what I do now, and, and get I resigned from the pharmaceutical industry about a year after that time with my mum. Uh, because as I began to recover, I, I realised and began to feel better. I realised I began to you know become more expansive and and more balanced and more with a greater sense of self. And I knew where I needed to go in my life, and so I left the job as I say, about a year later and, and went off to write books and, and do what I do now, you know, stand in front of you guys today and talk about this kind of stuff. And, and I kind of thought that that's me all, everything's great now, but inside I knew that it wasn't really. Because, you know, I wrote a series of books and I, I think I got to, I think I'd written about seven or eight at the time. And I, I had been struggling, not with depression this time, but with self-esteem. And you know, sometimes things occur at different times of your life that, dem that show you who you are at that time. And as my writing career and speaking career had increased in the, in the demands and the needs, I, I think, I, I, what became really clear is that I struggled with self-esteem. Uh, not the outward self-esteem. There's two types of self-esteem. There's a, the, you know, there's the external self-esteem where we derive our sense of worthiness from the positive things that happen to us, our successes and achievements. But that's not real self-esteem. That's external. Proper real self-esteem, self-love, you might call it, is the internal self-esteem. It's when you have an inner sense of worthiness and value uh, that is not dependent upon. Uh, successes and achievements. It's just a little inner feeling that, you know, I've got this, I'm okay, and it comes with self-compassion as well. And I had lot, uh, quite a bit of the former, the external, but almost none of the internal, the inside stuff. And I, uh, and, and it came to a head one day when I had like, a, like an anxiety attack at the side of the stage. I was about to follow, be the next speaker after the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, who was a personal hero of mine. And I, I had like an anxiety attack and it really was coming from a deep place of I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough. And I realised that I have to nail this, I have to sort this out. And but again, my, my, my repeating pattern up to that point was don't tell anyone how you feel. Because I began to feel ashamed that I had low self-esteem. Because it was expect, I think it was expected of me, having written seven previous books, how could I tell people especially the people who read my books, 
never, they'd never buy another book of mine again. If I could possibly say, by the way, I'm struggling with self-esteem here. You know, I didn't tell my, my fellow authors because I thought they had it all worked out. And I thought, how could I possibly tell them and my, my other friends that I was struggling with self-esteem? So I bottled it all up inside. But I decided I'm going to write a book on it. And I thought, I'll write a book on it because I know that I will immerse myself in the subject. And I, and I did try to immerse myself. And I submitted the first draft of the book to my publisher, Hay House. And Michelle Pilly, lovely lady, good friend, came, asked me if she could meet me for a coffee. And she said, when we sat down, she said, you know we all love you in the office. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh. She said, I just... I just can't accept this book as it is. If we publish the book as it is, it will be damaging for your career. <laughs> I don't tend to talk about that, these kind of things publicly, but that's exactly what she said. And, and she was very compassionate about it, really caring because she's a lovely human being, Michelle Pilly. And, but she really cared and she was saying it compassionately, nicely and trying to help me. And we talked a bit more and and I realised that I'd written the book in my head and I hadn't really dived into the, the whole issue which had been my lack of expressing how I feel. My bottling everything up and the lack of really tapping into, I guess, myself. And I ended up crying in front of Michelle. I had a big heart to heart and more tears for me. And again, and again it felt amazing relief to cry and just to get all this emotion out. And again, it, it comes back to that whole thing that it's not unique to guys, but I'd say it's more so with males as we tend not to show how we feel and we tend not to cry. Not that we don't have a need to cry, but we just tend not to do it because somehow in our heads we think we're not supposed to. We're supposed to be strong and, and man up and, you know, and be tough kind of thing and again that's not the same for it's not true for all guys and it's certainly true for a lot of women as well it's not as black and white as that but as a generalization I think we know you know we know what I'm talking about it's a generalization but certainly that was true for me and I had a really good cry in front of Michelle and, and opened up about some of the real deeper issues and the pressures I was feeling uh, and it, and that moment was the beginning of my journey to developing a real healthy sense of self-esteem. And, and that would not have been possible were it not for that willingness to express and have a cry in front of Michelle. Because what happened then is as I wrote the book, I really expressed my own feelings and I really was very honest about how I felt and honest with the personal struggles I was having and I was still having at that time and had had in the past. And I thought, and I struggled with the vulnerability of that at first. You know, what if I tell people? They'll say, my God, how could this guy have written any books? He's a mess. If I share all my real struggles that I've had. But I decided that what was more important is that we learn to, to, to do these things and relate to each other. And it's okay. It's actually the best thing. It's not just okay that we express emotion. It's vital that we, we do so. so. So the book became a personal journey. For me, the book was really a side effect of my personal journey. And as life would have it from time to time, I got one of my biggest lessons in, in vulnerability. When my, my dog, Oscar, was sick, he was limping on his back leg. And we thought he had a cruciate strain. The vet certainly thought that as well, because he was a young dog. He was only like 18, 19 months at the time. And common in Labradors, big, solid, 35 kilo male Labrador, it's not uncommon uh, for a young dog like that to have a little muscle strain from time to time. So we thought it was a cruciate strain. And I was in the, the, the specialist vet's office, and this was the, this is the, one of the guys who mentored SuperVet, <laughs> you know, and, and he came out and he said, I'm really sorry to tell you he has osteosarcoma. It's bone cancer, it's highly aggressive, especially in a dog his age. It's already progressed. He has about three months to live. And devastated. The ground just fell out. Myself and my partner Elizabeth just dissolved. We couldn't really make 
sense of what we were hearing. He said, if it would be easier for you, we could, he's still under anaesthetic, I could give him a bigger injection and let him go now. I, I couldn't quite hear what I was saying. And, and after processing that, I went into man up mode. And as Elizabeth is distraught, there I'm suddenly right, here we go. I've got this sorted, I've got it sussed. I know exactly what to do. It's my old male programming, got it sorted. I'm, I don't, I'm not gonna cry, I've got this, I'm tough, I can do it. Got on the phone to my mum, said, you've got this kind of herbal thing I know that I gave you a few years ago, I'm coming to get it. Told her what happened. She said, oh, I'm so sorry, son, so sorry to hear that. Ah, hey, mum, don't worry about me. I've got it, sorry, do you know what I'm like? God, I'm the, I, I've got the answer. I, I know exactly how we're gonna do this, gonna cure him, etc. it's gonna be great. Man up, man up, got it sorted. Drove through in the car to my mum and dad's house, walked in the door, my mum's standing in the centre of the living room, and as soon as I saw her, I just burst into tears. She gave me a great big hug, and I just wept for, I don't know how long, I just cried. And, and I hadn't cried in front of my mum since that day, several years earlier, maybe 20 years earlier, 15 years earlier when I, it opened up about the depression. And after a while, I suddenly became self-conscious and my dad was there. And, and I came out, but at the moment, I, but a little bit of me decided that I don't really care. In this moment, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to take any, allow anything to be taken away from how I feel about Oscar, my dog. I'm not going to let anything, take anything away from that. I'm not going to let my fears, my fear of being vulnerable, my fear of, of not manning up, of, of looking like a sissy, as I was called a couple of times at school when I did cry when I was a kid. Uh, I'm not going to let anything diminish my love for Oscar. So damn it, if I need to cry, I need to cry, kind of thing. And, and you know, I remember looking round at my dad when I came out the the embrace and he just turned away. And it wasn't intentional, it was like a reflex reaction because my dad had always been taught to man up and he didn't really knew, know what to do. But, you know, a, a few months later, about five months later, uh, those of you who've read the book, I Heart Me, uh, uh, or followed my, my story, or Oscar, he, he did pass away in, you know, an amazing last five months of bonding with him. But during that time, I, I refused to bottle up my emotions. And I thought I'd just let it go. And it was a massive learning for me about the importance of expressing how you feel and not bottling things up, but letting yourself, even if it made me look like a sissy or a weak, I didn't care. It was for me, it was saying, I love Oscar that much that I will not allow my fears to, and my worries about what people think of me to diminish that. And it was almost in honor of Oscar. And he, and he, he you know, passed away, and it was the hardest thing I'd ever uh, experienced in, in my life up till that point. And I remember, you know, a couple of months later, I was on stage. Uh, a couple of months later, I, I was on stage giving a talk, and the book had come out, and I was, you know, talking about self-esteem. And I ended up, didn't mean to end up talking about Oscar and what I'd learned about uh, having the courage to express how you feel, regardless of what that is. And for me, this was a lesson in vulnerability and the need to have courage to be vulnerable and not be concerned with whether people judged you for doing that. And it's actually such an important altogether thing. In fact, being vulnerable and having the courage and willingness to do so was actually in large part responsible for me developing a healthy self, a self sense of self-esteem. But I was talking about my experience in the loss of Oscar and I started crying in front in stage and there was like 700 people here at, at one of the events and I just couldn't stop crying. And I remember the thought entered my mind that my God, there's 700 people looking at me and I'm supposed to be giving a, a talk of wisdom and stuff, and here I am crying. And you know, when you're crying, sometimes you try not to, and you go, <sighs> and you're, you're trying to breathe and all that, and you're, 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 you're strained. And I did that for a few seconds, and then I thought, you know, fuck it, oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought, damn it, I don't care who, th who, who judges me, whether the 700 people here who, after seeing the mess that I am and not the wise, 
person. I'm supposed to be having written a book and supposed to have all these answers. I don't really care. And no one's going to buy the book now. And I don't care because this is how I feel. And what's more important than anything is me having the, the willingness and the courage to express my feelings and be myself. And if that means crying right now, then damn it, that's what I'm going to do. And I just let loose and stood there with a bit of light shining on me for I don't know how long until a woman ran up on stage from the audience and gave me a big hug. And it was beautiful. And it was really nice. And it, it was a real bonding and oh, an amazing moment with the audience as well as everyone uh, realised the importance of expressing how we feel and not bottling things up. So um, anyway, I, I didn't really plan on telling you so much about my life. And, and, and you know, I don't even know if... You know, Susie asked me to come on and talk about... Susie Walker, the Editor-in-Chief of Psychology, has asked me to come on and talk about this month's edition, uh, the men's edition, which is all, really all about about men... And, well, not all about, but there's a lot about men sharing their vulnerabilities and, and explaining that they've always felt a pressure to man up and, and it's really important that we, as men, at least open this dialogue about mental health and open this dialogue about about expressing emotion and recognising that it's actually okay to do so. And I don't really know, truth be told, I don't really know if I've said anything of any value. I don't feel like I've given any teachings. I think usually I find myself I'm talking and I'm teaching little things and I don't really know in this last, what, 25 minutes if I've done any of that at all. <laughs> but, but, I mean, sometimes I, I think just talking about our experiences even maybe if I haven't said anything wise, typically wise, which I don't really know if I have, I think maybe just sometimes talking about our experiences is, en is enough. Because I guess that's, you know, courage in and of itself to, to, to admit that you've had a hard time and admit that you've... In fact, still a lot of times I feel like I'm feeling about in the dark and don't really know what I'm doing half the time, even as a writer and speaker just kind of feeling my way in the dark and, you know, I certainly don't have it all worked out. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I'm, I'm willing to say that. And, and so even if, I don't know if I've said anything of any importance, any value, except maybe just share some of my own personal experiences. And if at the very least sharing some of my personal experiences might uh, motivate other people to do the same, then maybe that's uh, helpful. In fact, there's a wee comment from Karen saying, sharing experiences like that is always helpful. Thanks for that, Karen. Uh, and that maybe, maybe this is just part of the dialogue that us men have to open up a bit more about and talk about these things and, and men's uh, emotions and, and, and vulnerabilities and stuff. So, so anyway, uh, I, I hope that this has been kind of useful. At the very least, you've learned a little bit more about me. <laughs> And uh, so, so I'll sign off for now and I'll be probably back on the psychologies page in a couple of weeks in my usual slot at the beginning of the month talking about uh, kindness and all things kindness related. So all the best for now and I'll catch up with you soon. So have a great day wherever you are and bye for now.